Welcome back to the Bookends YouTube channel. I'm James McGowan. Hi, I'm Jessica Faust. And today we have Kim Lionetti with us, who is no stranger to the Bookends YouTube. Hello. Um, so if you've been following along on YouTube, you know that we have been one by one interviewing the Bookends agents for just a casual conversation. And today we are picking Kim's brain from all things starting at Bookends to her list today. Um, so let's just jump right in. Our first question for you, Kim, is not unlike our question for other agents here, but you started your career as an editor. Um, can you talk a little bit about your path to publishing and how you ultimately ended up at Bookends? We teased a little bit of this in Jessica's video, so I think everybody who watched that one is going to look forward to this answer. Well, I think Bookends super fans, for lack of a better word, might have heard at least hints or some of this before. <laughs> Well, I started out as an intern, just like you, James. Um, I was an intern at Berkeley Publishing when I was still in college. And um, just, I was the intern to Leslie Gelman, who was the editor in chief. And so I got to sit at a little typewriter stand that was just over um, a set of filing cabinets from young Jessica Faust, editorial assistant, <laughs> even though we really didn't give each other much of the time of day. You know, we did not. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then about a little over a year later, I ended up getting a job there and I worked for the two um, male editors. So I, they worked on techno thrillers and Westerns and, um, and I sort of made my way up through the ranks. And during that time, Jessica went on to other jobs and ended up starting um, bookends. But Kim didn't like me anyway, so she didn't mind when I left to go on to other jobs. Skip over. I was gonna skip over the part where I didn't like you. You can't. <laughs> but why? That's the best part. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about why. <laughs> I was just intimidated. I think everybody could understand that. I mean, anyway, James, you can understand. <laughs> anyway, um, and so then um, when uh, I heard from a colleague. And that was actually instrumental in the reason I hated Jessica. <laughs> now that I think about it, that Bookends was looking to expand. Immediately, and that colleague is no longer in publishing. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was like, hmm, maybe I should invite Jessica to lunch and pretend I want to buy projects off of her. <laughs> and then just subtly find out information on what she's looking for in a new agent. So it was a nice lunch too. What? It was a nice lunch too. It was Grange Hall. I miss that place. I know. It's very <laughs> cool, like historic New it's York. Cool. I know. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I love that I you know, remember the restaurant. I'm here. So. What were you saying, James? I love that you both remember the restaurant so vividly. Oh. Oh, totally. Totally. I remember I sitting at that table. I remember the booth we were at. Yeah. <laughs> Even like, though the booth isn't there anymore. It's like one of those, like, memorable first dates that, like, you <laughs> never forget memories. It was kind of like that. we have already known each other, but for how long? Um, yeah. Eight, well, nine years. And we liked each other by then, too. So yes, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'd grown on her and vice versa. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's how I made it to bookends. That's hilarious. Yep. Um, so you actually touched on our next question a little bit. You talked a little bit about Westerns and techno thrillers and working for the two male editors, but what was it like working on books in a genre that, um, you didn't necessarily know at first, they were new to you, and how has that shaped your editorial eye in general? Uh, I would say, you know, Honestly, when I started out as an editorial assistant, I just soaked in every, all the information, you know, I got to work, you know, the techno thrillers I was working on were Tom Clancy books. So that was really cool. Um, and, and the Westerns actually led me to um, my first big promotion at Berkeley because once that editor left, I volunteered to take over the whole Western program and was promoted as a result of it. And what? You know that. Oh, now you do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a result, um, uh, that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> I was just going to say, I even though westerns were not, um, 
you know, something that I had a lot of experience with or had read a lot before. Um, it's just all about good storytelling. You know, I certainly read a lot of fiction. Uh, I just, I pretty much read only fiction as <laughs> Jessica knows. But um, so I knew what, what good storytelling was. I knew what good pacing was. I knew how, um, you know, how to develop, I don't know how to develop, but I knew how to tell other people how to develop good characters. <laughs> um, so I, you know, it played to all my strengths because there's nothing more fast paced and suspenseful than a Western. So I brought all of that to um, my editorial work there. And also now, even when I became an agent, I mean, it's nice when you become an agent that you can work on the genres and the books that you're passionate about. But um, I also, you know, work on books that aren't necessarily what I re read in my free time, but um, they st I still know that I can sell them. I know um, that it plays to my strengths again. And, um, and really, you know, it's a business. So while I, I am passionate about every book I sell, there are definitely ones that are more likely to be the type of thing that would be in my TBR pile. One of the things that Kim and I both had similar experiences of, of at Berkeley, and that's something that was really great about working there is um, I was an assistant to science fiction fantasy editor, and that was definitely not an area of expertise for me. And even when I started, to be honest, I started as the editorial assistant to a romance editor, and unlike Kim, um, I was not necessarily a passionate romance reader. And what we were able to take away from those experiences is that we are very skilled at editing and we are very skilled at helping authors shape and develop and grow books. And as agents, we are very skilled in negotiating the best deals for our clients. And I know that authors often hear from agents that we have to love something, but that love can come in a lot of different ways. Um, and I know Kim's experience, she has a real um, soft spot for Western authors. I think sometimes she loves the authors more than she loves the books. Because <laughs> they call me darling. <laughs> <laughs> also, Kim, you said that you, you can't tell, you can't develop characters, we can tell someone how to do it. And I think there's a lot of that advice, like, oh, um, people might see that advice. Well, what do you know? You never wrote a book, right? But we know story. That's our business. That's sort of our job. And we know what makes a story, a good story tick and how to remedy the things that don't. And you can apply it to really any genre. Yeah, so many of those things are universal. It's funny what, what Jessica said earlier. Um, I think something that I've tried and feel like it doesn't play to my strengths is the sci-fi fantasy because I don't think I am good at telling people how to build worlds. Yes, um, I that's agree. not part of my wheelhouse. So, um, so it isn't. You know, it's not like I feel like I can do anything. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I do know what areas um, I play to my strengths and I can work on despite, um, no matter the genre, those universal things that we talked about. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. You can't do everything, but you do know your strengths and that's key. Yeah. Um, so over the course of your agenting career, Kim, you've likely seen many a market shift and change. And that means your list has to sort of shift and change to adapt to that. How have you, how have you seen your list change? And can you talk about how that changed you as an agent or how it continues to change? Sure. Um, I do always hate the trends questions, <laughs> but I think part of that is because um, over the, because I've, I have, it has been such a long time, James, since I first started publishing until now, <laughs> that in all those years, I've come to see that so many of these trends are cyclical and, um, and so things that seem like they're going away or, um, or actually do um, trend down for a while do eventually come back. So in terms of my uh, agenting list, um, my client list, I think in some ways those trends change my list and in others they don't because um, I, I do, I, 
I do like to think of myself as an agent who perseveres uh, with my clients and um, sticks to them. And I just feel very determined. So that doesn't mean that, for instance, when I first started out agenting, um, chiclet was huge. And so I took on some chiclet clients and they either did sell for a brief amount of time or didn't sell. And then chiclet was just kind of a dirty word, even though that has sort of, I would argue that rom-com now is very much sort of the chiclet, but don't tell anybody else I said that. Um, <laughs> so, um, but for those years in between, um, we found, I, I thought about their voice, uh, the client's voice and how it could be used in other ways. And, um, and they started writing cozy mysteries for me because I realized, um, you know, they could really use some of that light um, sense of humor for a, a diff slightly different market. And, um, and so I was able to sell them that way. So I, I will say like for right now, um, I think there's a trend towards lighter reads and it really reflects in what I'm reading at home, um, which is rom-com, romance, I mean, that's really all I'm reading right now. It's all I can get through during quarantine and COVID and all of that. And so I will say that a lot of the stuff that I've brought on recently are rom-coms, um, just because I think everybody is sort of feeling that way. But, um, but I still do have my other clients that are working on darker things. And, and I do think there's still a market for it, just finding the right place and the right time. So while my list does change with the trends, in some ways it doesn't either. Um, and I just think you have to be determined to see it through and, you know, maybe make small little tweaks here and there to make it work. And sometimes you find that they have this strength that you never recognized before that you didn't know about because they've never been um, asked to utilize it. <laughs> yeah. And I think we've both seen throughout the course of our career as editors and agents, the authors who have really grown. I mean, I can name so many authors who were there as um, really small mid-list series authors and have grown their career to, you know, to be some of the stars you all know now, but would never have thought. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the growth they've taken in their writing. Right. And I think it's not, I feel like maybe it would, some might think their back would get up. It's not really changing who they are as a writer. Um, it's just, um, like I said, finding these new strengths and other ways to um, nudge them or, or even market, it, market what they do differently than what they might've thought they were first going into. Do you find that as an agent, you have more freedom to work with the authors and sort of um, coach them into new directions that maybe they didn't even see themselves than you would have had as an editor? Or do you feel that editors can do that in similar way? I definitely think I do it more as an agent. I think editors are so um, stretched for time and have... Um, meetings and so so many things that and they're not they don't have a vested interest which let's face it i do by earning a commission they don't have a vested interest in um growing that person's career or you know while while editors and authors do have um you know build important close relationships at the same time, they've got a million other authors coming into them, being submitted to them that if they might um, not think of you as changing course because they can just pick up somebody new to do something like that in their inbox. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> and editors also have a corporate overhead that drives sometimes their abilities to do things. You know, um, as an agent, we can take a struggling author, and by struggling, I mean low sales, and really work to revamp their career. As an editor with, you know, sort of the corporate numbers over their head, that might not allow them to do that in some cases. Sure. Since, since I asked the editor-agent question, 
are there things you miss doing or having from your editor days? Um, and are there things that maybe you really like more about being an agent that makes you not miss your editor days? Um, I would say the only thing I miss is the community of working in the office. However, I would also not want a different situation. <laughs> wow. I mean, part of the reason I left was because I wanted um, the ability to work from home and have sort of a flexible schedule. Um, but and now with COVID, I mean, <laughs> um, I've, I'm used to this sort of workspace, but, um, but I miss, you know, the water cooler and, and because I was, you know, because those were my first jobs out of college, I built like really strong friendships, except with you. And while I was, <laughs> while I was at Berkeley, <laughs> um, so, so those, those are some of my best friends. And so I miss being able to see them, but um, I don't really miss much else. <laughs> I just like um, being on this side and I like, you know, picking the projects that I want to work on and having that freedom. Um, and if a relationship doesn't seem to be working between me and a client, um, you know, having the uh, power to say, you know, this isn't working rather than um, having to hear, oh no, the sales are too good. You have to keep working. <laughs> so I, I've told this story before too, but um, one of the last straws for me in editorial was I was working on these books that sold a lot of copies, but the author was um, kind of a misogynist and uh, and made the publicists cry and stuff. And so I just, I wanted to let the next project go. And I was told I couldn't because they made too much money. And it totally made sense. I, you know, I couldn't blame that decision, but it made me realize that I just wanted to be able to make that decision for myself. <laughs> I have a question. Did that last book actually still make money? Um, I'm not really sure. I don't think it made as much as, the previous ones had. Um, it feels good. Those actually seem to still be around a little bit, not in a big way, but um, I don't know. I kind of cut that part of my life out. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. We won't make you dig it up then. Okay. <laughs> well, we can't have you on and not talk about rom-coms because your list is just um, a powerhouse rom-com list <laughs> amongst others. Um, well, you represent people like Helen Wong and Nicola Marsh, who's books and other forthcoming authors um, in the rom-com space. So can you talk a little bit about that trend and what draws you to it? I mean, like Jessica said, I grew up reading romance. Um, I more started out with like gothic romances, which are not quite as light, but um, I just, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I just like the escapism um, and, in fact, you know, my other favorite author before I started interning at Berkeley was Nora Roberts. And then I got to work at Berkeley who published Nora Roberts. And that was just a dream come true too. So my love of romance um, has always been there. And then when I was working for the boy books, um, I had to sort of put it aside while well, those techno thrillers in the Westerns, you know, I wasn't working for editors that were doing women's fiction and romance. So I had to put it aside a little bit and I just dabbled in it here and there. But then um, by the time when I became an agent, it was my moment <laughs> to really be able to focus on it again. And, um, and, and like I said, the, I, I really feel like the chick lit of however many years ago is <laughs> kind of the rom-com of today. And, um, and I think, like I said, now more than ever, we just need that escapism. I um, I like funny. I, I always say I tend to like opposite ends of the spectrum. I like funny and light, and I like dark and creepy. <laughs> Not so much in the middle. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, and now how it's evolved is I'm really wanting more diverse rom-coms. Um, the Kiss Quotient has just been a dream. Um, you know, I'm an autism mom. Um, my 15 year old son is on the spectrum and 
I wanted to make sure that there were voices represented, neurodiverse voices represented. And um, I sort of put a call out there and I'm actually not sure Helen Huang saw that call. I think it was more coincidence that I ended up seeing the Kiss Quotient. Um, and as soon as she actually got an offer on it and I read it like in one sitting and I laughed, I cried. I was just, I was like, this is the book I've been waiting for because ever since I had put that call out, um, I'd seen a ton of books with autistic or neurodiverse or characters, but none of them um, felt as authentic as Helen's. And um, it was very important to me that the, these neurodiverse characters were felt authentic, but also were completely relatable, um, which is what she, um, really is able to bring across because I think all of us deal with um, some part of the spectrum <laughs> of neurodiversity. Some of that OCD, that anxiety, you know, we can all sort of relate to something that, um, that her characters deal with. And, and I really, it's just been so rewarding to see so many um, readers respond well to her books and and to see that you know publishers now are looking for more neurodiverse um, authors and and hopefully that'll continue to grow and I'm still looking for more <laughs> neurodiverse or or even autism moms talking about um, dealing with special needs or um, anything like that. But I do think we continue to need more of that in, in the book market. And joy. Stories of joy. I'm, yes. I'm tired of reading the um, terrible tragedy neurodiverse character stories. I yeah, those aren't more, for me. <laughs> yeah, no, they are not for him. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's okay to talk about the challenges, but also to show some of the joys and even the humor in, in the day to day. So, but not, yeah, not a sad story. Okay, Kim, well, that's all of our questions for you, but thank you for joining us on YouTube and answering them and teaching me all about this um, restaurant and con story, all these details I did not know. Um, it's I always- really use a trip to Grange Hall right now. <laughs> Close, long closed. I know. <laughs> it's always cool to hear the stories of, of like your coming together, I think, and how bookends really started to grow. But um, yeah, so- So far apart. <laughs> what? After we started so far apart. Yeah, it's definitely- yeah, So far apart. A rom, like a working relationship rom-com. <laughs> there you go. How about that? You started a rom-com enemies to friends. There you go. <laughs> I take it in women's fiction form. There you yeah. go. Well, thank you so much for joining us. If anybody has any questions for Kim, don't hesitate to put them in the comments. We'll make sure she gets an answer to you. But don't forget to like and subscribe, and we hope to see you back for more of our conversations with the Bookends agents and our regular weekly videos as they post. Bye. Thank you. Bye.